Good morning and uh, welcome. And as always, a very warm welcome if it's your first time here. I hope you had a good meditation with Lala Taratna next door. Yeah, very good. Doing the Metta Bhavna. Um, yeah, so today, I, I, I mean, well, what am I going to talk about? Talk about wisdom, uh, which is a bit of a stupid idea, but we'll try. Um, so there's many ways in, well, in the Buddhist tradition to talk about wisdom or, I don't know how you say, the illuminated mind, insight. And I think today I'd, I wanted to approach it from the point of view of it being something natural, yeah? something inherent, which is what the Buddha talks about in a way. He says, um, the illu- you could say the illumined mind, yeah, wisdom, um, is natural, but it's, it's covered. Yeah? So it's a, in a way, it's a very positive way of looking at human beings. It's the opposite of original sin in a way. Yeah? So there's just this stuff on us, but generally inside, there's something uh, luminous. Yeah? So I thought there's a particular moment in the Buddha's life, which is called the rose apple tree moment. So I thought I'd have a look at that. And then also look at another um, a set of teachings called the Two Veils from later Buddhism. And we'll see how this all fits. If you've been on the retreat last week, uh, this is basically, I apologize, I apologize, it's a rehash of the talk I gave there, so, but hopefully it's an improved version, yeah? Um, so it's a bit of an experiment today, seeing, seeing if all this stuff fits together, we'll find out. Yeah, so in order to get to this, um, well, this moment, this key moment in the, in the Buddha's journey, which has come to be called the rose apple tree moment, yeah, um, I thought I'd just very briefly go through his journey, yeah, very briefly. So uh, the Buddha was born, or the Buddha-to-be, Siddhartha Gautam, was born roughly two and a half thousand years ago in northern India. Um, sometimes he gets called a prince, but it was a republic, it seems, yeah, so he's probably the kind of son of a... Uh, ruling family or chieftain of some sort, yeah? And in a way, you could say his early life was um, one of uh, learning how to take power, um, also hedonism, yeah? But also, he was, he was basically born to rule, yeah? So that's what he was learning to do. Um, yeah, I mean, for the way the story is told, he kind of had everything that everybody seems to be striving for, as much food, sex, entertainment, status, he had everything, yeah? So he had all that, but he was also, what you might say, uh, unusually aware, yeah? So I can imagine, I'm not sure it's always phrased like this, but he's asking why a lot, I'd imagine, yeah? Why, like um, most of us kind of mindlessly go through our lives, I guess, and uh, we don't really ask why, a lot of people don't ask why, or if you do ask why, you kind of forget the question, but he, he, he kind of didn't, yeah? So. I imagine it started to kind of uh, work, work on him, yeah? It kind of, uh, he kept asking that question, why this, why that, what's the purpose? A bit like when you're a teenager or you're a kid, uh, you'll ask your mum, why, why does your mum need to, your mum needs to work, why? Why does mum need to work? You know, he's asking all these, I can imagine asking all these questions. But anyway, it gets traditionally put, as, he saw what's called uh, the four sights, yeah? So old age, sickness and death, yeah? And a wanderer. So uh, he really saw them, yeah, in a way that I guess we don't, we see these things around us, in us, but we don't really see them, yeah. Um, We kind of see these things, old age, sickness and death, from a kind of removed position, yeah, it's sort of abstracted for us, it's not a kind of, it's not an actual experience, in a way. Um, I mean, the thing about the Buddha's life life as well, it's it's got kind of... um, well, it's an archetypal journey, but it's a, it's a journey that you can kind of imprint on your own life. Yeah, we all go through these kind of things ourselves. And I was thinking about, um, did I ever see something like, did I ever see old age when I was younger? And of course I did, but I, I think I saw, had one moment when I, um, when I was on holiday with my granddad. And my granddad was, I think he was like a hero of mine. Yeah, he was a very upright man. Very, he was in the commandos, a very physical character. Um, and he, I was on holiday and he was in this kind of um, sandbank and he came down, walked down to meet me and he tripped and stumbled and kind of fell on me. And he was incredibly embarrassed. And it was a very strange moment, I won't forget, but it was like a, oh wow, oh God, he's getting old. Yeah, it was like a real imprint. And well, the Buddha's seeing that in a very direct way, like, oh right, this is what happens, yeah? So, yeah, so actually there was, yeah, we'll leave it there. Uh, so he saw these things directly, yeah, but then he also saw a wanderer, yeah, what's called a Shramanira. 
this person who's kind of in the world, but looked like uh, he wasn't kind of doing the usual stuff, someone maybe a bit kind of uh, a bit more switched on. So all these things basically activated something in him and he left his life, he left his home completely, yeah? He wandered into the forest and um, into the jungles, yeah? In search of something else. Um, so you could say the first thing that he encountered uh, maybe was fear, yeah? Being alone, I guess, initially in a forest in ancient India, it was fear. There's tigers, snakes, bandits, ghosts, all kind of things, yeah? So he was in the forest. Maybe the other thing was food, yeah? So his whole life completely changed. Either they, have the, they had the whole kind of arms around thing, so people would, you'd beg for your food. they put uh, food in your bowl. And the first time he had a meal, which was just mixed up stuff, a bit of curry, a bit of yogurt, tea, all kind of jumbled up, he actually vomited, yeah? So he was, he was from a kind of, he had a privileged life, but he ate that and vomited. So that was his introduction, yeah? Um, so then he goes on to find uh, seemingly two of the greatest meditation teachers at the time, yeah? And in a quite a short period of time, masters what they were teaching, yeah? Which I thought is actually related to later in the story. It's really important to know that. It's like, it's not like, it's like he actually really did master meditation and he still wasn't free. That's very interesting. He like really knew how to go into all these formless states and all these different higher states of consciousness, but that wasn't the thing in and of itself that freed him, yeah? So he was in all these higher states of consciousness, bliss, absorption, I don't know, infinite space, all this kind of stuff, yeah? And that's where most traditions stop, yeah? You'd assume, some people have had those experiences and they assume they've reached some kind of ultimate point, yeah? Some godhead or something like, ah. Uh, but the Buddha didn't, or the Buddha-to-be didn't. He was like, oh, I'm not actually free. I'm, there's still, I can still fall back from this. If I don't meditate, if I don't do all these things, I still regress into this state. So he's ah, I'm not free, yeah? So he left, again, he left these people, um, his teachers who actually offered him to, they offered for him to lead their disciples, but he left. Next thing he tried um, was uh, skepticism, basically like um, self-torture, yeah? This whole kind of concept that somehow you can remove this thing called a soul or a spirit from the body, yeah? So you punish the body and you liberate this pure soul, this... Yeah, you overcome worldly uh, constraints with your willpower. Yeah? So he tried that and apparently he was really successful. Yeah? He, was, <laughs> he could feel his belly button, uh, feel his rib, uh, his spine, sorry, through his stomach. You know, his fingernails are probably falling out, his hair, and everyone's like, oh yeah, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's doing it. And then I think he, he was washing himself <laughs> once washing himself in a kind of very small stream, like a puddle or something, and almost drowned. Yeah, he sort of fell in, he was, like, he was so weak. And then he realized this is pointless. I'm actually just killing myself. I'm not actually uh, freeing myself at all. Yeah? So yet again, uh, he decided to leave that and everyone was very disappointed again. He left that life. Um, yeah, and then after that, is when he has this memory, yeah? So he's had all this exertion and all these trials, yeah? He's been learning to meditate, mast you could say mastering meditation. He's been kind of exerting himself physically, yeah? Trying to conquer his body and none of that worked. And then he said, all right. And then he has this memory, yeah? And the memory is super simple. It's basically of him when he's a child with his back against a tree, a rose apple tree, watching his father um, ploughing a field. Yeah? So it said, I mean, it said his, fa his father was kind of ceremonially, ceremonially ploughing it because he was a kind of ruler. Yeah? So it's probably the beginning of spring or something like this, um, getting the field ready, and that's it. But the memory is one of complete contentment. Yeah? So he's there. It's, it's, when, when you read it, it sounds like an, an illuminated image. Yeah? It's not just a kind of random memory, the memory itself has some kind of potency to it and some kind of light coming from it, at least in the Buddha's mind, yeah? So, it's a, for me, I always found it a strange image to have at the peak of a kind of story. It's a bit like, it's not, I was like saying in this WhatsApp group, it's not exactly Lord of the Rings, is it? It's not like you get this kind of build up and then he bursts over the hilltop with light coming out of him. It's more like, oh, and then he just remembers being a boy sitting against a tree, looking at his dad in a field, but he's, content, you know, there's a kind of natural 
absorption. He doesn't want anything, he's not pushing anything away. He's just there and he's present, completely present. Yeah? And that memory sends him on a completely different path. Yeah? And he thinks, ah, and it opens up, that memory opens up the, uh, the path to enlightenment. Yeah? So, I mean, well, what is going on there? Yeah? Um, you, know, you mean you, you could say it's the beginning of the middle way, yeah? in a sense. That is definitely one way of looking at it. He's, he's tried, in a way, his previous life was one of extreme hedonism, yeah? you could say, hedonism and power. And that's one way, one thing we try and do, isn't it? And then the other way is like extreme willpower and asceticism. He's going to bend himself into shape or out of shape and liberate something. That didn't work. And this middle way, this, this, this memory maybe, is the start of that kind of journey of like, oh, right, complete absorption, awareness, but not, there's pleasure there as well. And it, it's, it's, for the Buddha at least, it seems to be a key. Yeah? So that kind of memory, obviously, he takes with him. So he takes that memory with him um, and sits under another tree, a Bodhi tree. And somehow, uh, through the journey of a, 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 a night, attains enlightenment, yeah? So, I don't really know what, what it means. It's still a mystery to me, obviously, this whole thing. I've always found it a mystery, like I was saying in this text. I've, I've found this particular memory and this part of the Buddha's life a complete mystery, yeah? But also, oddly enough, one of those things that's um, convinced me about Buddhism. I don't even know why, but it kind of made me think, ah, oh, there's something to this, yeah? This whole business of this seemingly ordinary moment, but actually it's kind of an illumined moment and it being the key to the Buddha's new, uh, to the Buddha to be's new path, kind of opens something up. So I don't even know what it is. I mean, um, in a way, uh, well, actually, there's, there's, there are some different versions of it, apparently, that, or, or elaborations. One is, uh, they're obviously poetic. One elaboration is there's, uh, there's, there's a sun. The sun never sets, yeah? So in this memory, I don't know, it's kind of like a poetic uh, elaboration of this, the same story, but the sun never sets. So it's, there's no grasping. There's no sense of anything falling away and you having to grab after it. It's just a kind of an illuminate, like a different state of consciousness, yeah? an illumination, which I find very interesting. Um, and also, you know, interestingly, I think this image, this memory, uh, I was thinking about it, sort of communicates something of the flavour of Buddhism itself, or at least Buddhists that you generally meet. Yeah? I, I, there's a kind of, you know, on a good day, there's a kind of ease and an engagement, and something's relaxed, but also alert and aware, and in a way seemingly very ordinary, but also not. And I thought, oh, it's sort of, um, it's sort of been my experience of the way I experienced Buddhism or Buddhists yeah, on a good day. It's something to do with this image, I thought. Um, but anyway, for me, the main kind of point of interest was that it's a kind of natural state. Yeah? It's not something extra, yeah? in a way. And the Buddha says later on, like, something along the lines of the mind, the mind is naturally luminous. Yeah? It's naturally full of light but it's defiled uh, by the adventitious defilements. I don't even know what that means in English, so I'm sorry about that. Adventi I don't know. Anyway, the adventitious defilements, yeah? So it's like it's your mind is corrupted in a sense. It's got stuff on it, but the mind is naturally luminous, yeah? So it's something natural um, to be uncovered, yeah? Rather than something extra that you're doing to yourself, because in a way the previous journey is all about you doing stuff to yourself. Yeah, you're trying to do this and you're trying to do that. And that's all important. It's not like a, it's a bit of a paradox, but in a way it's not. Yeah, so you're doing all this stuff, but actually the mind by itself is naturally luminous, only it's covered by stuff. Yeah. So a few hundred years later, you get this teaching of the two veils, which I found really, really helpful, which is exactly, it seems to be about this. Yeah, in the, the sense that you have wisdom shining, in this case, I guess, towards you. Yeah, you have the light of wisdom coming towards you all the time, but you have these two veils. Yeah? I don't know if everyone knows what veil means, but veil is something like curtain. Yeah? It's like a covering, like a cloth. Or you have these two cloths, yeah? and so the light can't quite get through, but you get some of it, but just not enough. Yeah? 
So the two veils um, is kind of just what I wanted to look at really in, in relation to that thing, this, 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 natural, this natural light perhaps coming towards you, this wisdom, and these two coverings, yeah? So they've got good names, yeah? So the first one is called uh, Klesha Varana, and the second one's called Nye, <laughs> Nye Varana, which kind of, I don't know, they, they, anyway, they work, you'll see why. So Klesha Varana means something like disturbing emotions, yeah? So that's the first veil. It doesn't really matter which way around they go. They kind of add up to the same thing in the end, which is kind of one veil. Forget that. Two veils. So the first veil, <laughs> the first veil is Klesha Varana, yeah? Which is something like, uh, the defilements, yeah, disturbing emotions, uh, in this case, poisons. So what are they? Well, they're things like craving, yeah? So one of them is craving, yeah, uh, greed. So that's one part of this veil, yeah? So what's it like when you're full of greed or craving? Uh, not much gets in, does it? You've got this kind of thing and your world shrinks around it and everything else is pushed out and yours, you shrink and the world shrinks and you can't really see clearly, can you? You know, when you're in, it's, it's a kind of fixation on a certain outcome or a thing, and you lose that direct connection, which is the opposite of maybe that image of the Buddha with his father, this openness, connection, nothing in the way. When you're in a state of craving, it's a kind of, everything gets contorted into a little tunnel, yeah? Kind of tunnel vision, so that's one side of it. Um, yeah, there's a fear in there as well, isn't it? You're constantly kind of... Anyway. <laughs> the other one is aversion, yeah? So hatred, it's like, again, that massively distorts one's um, vision of reality, doesn't it? I know for a fact, when I'm in a state of hatred, everything is different, yeah? People are ugly, the world is ugly, um, I'm ugly, the whole thing's just horrible, yeah? And it's a complete... It's another veil, it's just not... It got, as soon as the hatred's gone, that view's gone. You know, that, 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 that experience of the world evaporates once that hatred evaporates. But if that hatred's there, you can't help but see things like that. So it's another part of the covering, yeah? Um, and the other one, I mean, there's sometimes five, but let's just stick with three. The other one is ignorance, yeah? It's a kind of confusion about reality itself, yeah? One moment, one moment we're over here, the next minute we're over there. And it's another part of this emotional kind of covering, yeah? So you have these coverings on you. Um, so they're divided, so this is kind of what you might say the, the emotive, the, um, the emotional side. The other veil, Nyevarana, is something to do with views. It's like views, it's more like the thinking, you could say cognitive side, yeah, the way you, you interpret the world. But they're not strictly divided, yeah. Um, Yeah, so these emotions, the, these distortions, in a way, I thought, oh, they're like a, they are like a hall of mirrors, aren't they? You know, you end up, when, you, when, you, when you've got these kind of emotions going through you, you're kind of, everything's fragmented and fra fractal. You can't kind of see clearly, yeah? Um, you can't see things as they actually are. So that's the first veil. The second veil, Nyeovarana, um, it kind of operates on two levels, yeah? You could say it operates on one level, which is a bit more... Um, well, relatively superficial, and then it operates on another level, which is a bit deeper, yeah? So the superficial level of these views, yeah, this veil of views, you might say, is probably something to do with our conditioning, yeah? Generally our conditioning that we're not really aware of, yeah? Um, and the second layer is a bit more primal than that. But I just thought we'd have a brief look at this kind of uh, layer of conditioning, yeah? So. For example, where you're born, yeah, literally the climate, you know, the history of that place, um, what, what era you were born into, yeah, your age, yeah, there's a whole set of views around that, technology, yeah, your race, your gender, education, money, all these things, they kind of form a whole set of views that um, give you a covering, yeah, they, 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 they give you a certain veil over your experience, yeah. So, yeah, so you've got your place of birth, your land. I, w I was born in England. Ah, it was very strange. I was saying this last night, but I've never felt English at all. I cannot tell you why, but I never had any sense of being English. But uh, friends of mine definitely felt very English. Uh, so it does something. that If you're English, then you have a certain perception of the world, yeah, which you just assume is true. 
It just is true. Yeah, it's not a it's not up for debate. It's not like an idea. It's just the way the world is. Of course, because I'm English. <laughs> so it's like, but it's not true. Yeah. So, and I was thinking. It's funny. I was um, I was thinking about. Well, I think about my dad actually. It was like. Oh God, it's all always being recorded now, isn't it? But anyway, he's, it's not bad. Anyway, but I was just thinking, he's got a certain way of walking, yeah? And a certain energy to him, the way he is in the world, yeah? That I've just, just I always just thought is him, unique, yeah? Um, and he's partially Georgian, yeah? He's like, his father is Georgian. Does anyone know what Georgia is? Like, uh, Caucasus, mm. Turkey, Russia, anyway, that part of the world, yeah? He doesn't know anything really about, he's never been there. It's like not his... Yeah, and I didn't know anything about it. And then I went to this cafe, this Georgian cafe in East London, in Hackney. And the, the woman who's running the place, I was like, she just walked like him and there was a certain energy. And I was like, oh my God, it's to do with Georgia. It's not just my dad. Yeah, I'd assumed it was just him. Like he had a certain way. I was like, oh no, it comes from a place that, yeah. So it's like all of us, we all have a place. We all have a kind of place that colors us completely. Yeah, that we might just think is us. Yeah, um, and then how about, well, your age, yeah? You're, right, anyway, I'm going to say, but <laughs> the era that you're born in, yeah? It comes with a whole load of views, doesn't it? Like, um, like we're just, at, I mean, you can get into this thing, isn't it? Because we're at the kind of crest of evolution at the moment, we're like, all of us, amazing. We're here, like, on this crest of evolution. We just think we, we're kind of, yeah, we're one step ahead of everyone else, obviously, because we're cutting edge, but, in a few years, it's like all of our views that we hold now and all our ideas about things, people will look at history books and go, oh my God, that's interesting. They actually thought that, didn't they? And then they behave like that. And we're so convinced that it's just the way the world is, yeah? And that's, our, that's another veil. And um, yeah, I think, the, 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 again, the, the strongest experience I had of that was uh, visiting my mum in Copenhagen, yeah? She's Danish. And... There's a natural history museum, like the Viking Museum, yeah? And it's, I have to say, if you go there, it is actually really well curated. You know, it starts like 30,000 years. You've got these kind of flint axes, actually exquisite. They're really beautiful, yeah? And you just walk, you're walking through time and you start getting into a different consciousness almost, or at least I did. And then you end up in this one section and there's these huge kind of uh, ceremonial axes, yeah? with these kind of curly horns that some of them they've re reproduced and you can hear them. So you, I put these headphones on and you've got this kind of yeah, you've got these kind of horns and these axes. And just for like a couple of minutes, it was like I fell out of my 21st century conditioning into a kind of different, uh, well, a thousand years ago, yeah, different. And it was like, you know, when you really feel it and you're like, oh, and Thor's not just a Marvel comic character and it's like you know the gods are actually real and a real sense of like oh that was real to them and we're not actually right in the way we view things now we're completely temporary as well and in a thousand years someone put on some headphones well I don't know what they put on <laughs> god knows what happens man if we're still vaguely human or I don't know anyway something will happen and there, there'll be some experience of this Going, oh my god that is so weird wow it's like a completely different state of consciousness yeah like very different so we're just not aware of that that's what i mean so uh, that's one part of it technology yeah i listened to a great interview what's his name yanis i can never say his name yanis what varifakis yanis varifakis who wrote a book recently uh, called techno feudalism i thought oh that's changing the way that's another part of our veil isn't it the whole kind of technological interactions we have yeah that's another part of the veil what's another part well race yeah i grew up in a very racially mixed environment and it's like it was interesting like a lot of black friends of mine it's like i can't you know it's a very different experience even just in terms of like friends of mine saying there's not enough sun you've got you've got, you've got a lot of mel melanin and there's not enough sun it's like it's a very different experience which will cover things yeah gender obviously it's a similar kind of thing they're all specifics aren't they yeah um, I was actually thinking, funny enough, this is always something I found a bit disturbing, but kind of interesting. It's like just the way your body feels, yeah? Like whether you're tall or short, that's one thing, or the way your feet land on the floor, or if I've got like tension in my neck, yeah? It changes my perception of reality, which I found disturbing. I thought just a tiny little change in my physical experience 
Like if you go to the gym, you're doing, well, I don't, but when I used to, when I was young, doing loads of like weights, you feel robust. You feel like, oh yeah, I'm less vulnerable than other people. Yeah, but you're not <laughs> at all. You just got a bit of muscle and it, it changes your perception of reality, yeah? And um, I was thinking one time, but I kind of, I don't know how, but I kind of ended up going deaf in both ears. I thought I was deaf. It was actually just wax. I was in a studio with headphones for like months and months. And then the doctor said, put um, olive oil in my, in, your ear, in my ears, yeah? And I spent like a day and a half, more or less deaf, walking around. And I was shocked because it was like the whole universe had shrunk to kind of body size. And I thought, oh, right. So my sense of space is completely dependent on hearing, like the way things rebound off walls. It's, always, it's creating a sense of expansion. Um, anyway, so I found that interesting. Um, OK, maybe one last little one. But one that I found quite shocking was to do with tiredness. Yeah. So there was, I'm reading an interesting book at the moment about mindfulness, and they did this, um, well, she did this research to do with judges, you know, like parole judges, like, so you go to jail, and it's your time to get released or not get released, yeah? And they discovered that there's a 60, there was a 65% increase chance of you staying in prison if your hearing was before lunch. So if the judge was hungry, he was annoyed, and it's like, Forget this guy, he's going back. 65% increase, that is shocking. <laughs> so if you are hungry and you're tired, that affects, that's another, another part of this covering, isn't it? Mm. Like I didn't have green tea this morning. I always have green tea. And um, I desperately managed to get a cup before I was doing this talk, so I thought otherwise it's gonna, it's gonna flop. So that's, 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 that's part of it. Anyway, so they're all like building blocks, right? So, but I think then obviously then what happens to us, we do a more specific thing. We get the basic building blocks, country, body, race, blah, 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 blah. And then we make it more and more specific, don't we? It's just like, we're not just into electronic music. We're into this kind of techno and it can't be that techno. It's got to be this techno and then there's this. And then and we're not into these kind of clothes. They've got to be just like this. And we make ourselves more and more detailed and specific and feel more kind of unique and separate. Yeah, and so that's all going on as well. So we do the same thing with political views, yeah, and I guess we end up, contra you know, we define ourselves in contrast to other people. And yeah, that's the way we do it. We get more and more specific, and I'm not you because I'm me, and I've got this kind of jumper and not that jumper, yeah. Um, so this kind, of, uh, this kind of thing is very difficult. It's very difficult to spot, I guess, in the moment, uh, but in a way, that's what you're doing in Buddhism. You just you, you start seeing your own conditioning more and more clearly through time, yeah? But that's in a way said to be the, the kind of superficial layer, yeah? So the kind of, the deeper layer, in a sense, is this whole business of selfing at all. So you've got these ideas, you've got these sense of yourself on that level in terms of your generalized conditioning, but there's this whole process underneath that of how we actually get a sense of being a separate, fixed individual self in a world of se separate, fixed individual beings, yeah? Which is on a much more primal level, yeah? Um, I mean, there's all, I'm not gonna go into, I'm probably not clever enough to be honest, like to sit here and start talking about how, why we abstract ourselves to create uh, a future for ourselves and then we can survive and thrive and communicate and all this. There's a whole kind of reason why we kind of get into this abstracting process and labeling, yeah, where we kind of label things. Um, but in a way, the Buddha say, the Buddha's saying that's a veil as well, because thing, things are not things, are they? So we have this sense of like being in a world of things, but things are pure processes that are kind of co-arising with other pure processes. And that's very different from living in a world of fixed objects in relation to one another. So even saying something like things are impermanent, is just, well, yeah, are there things, yeah? But we do this whole, we do the opposite out of necessity, I guess. We, we don't stay on that level because we find it very difficult to live in a world of like pure um, experience, yeah, pure process. So we can't help but just um, congeal things, yeah? Turn, like name things, uh, nail it all down so it's fixed and knowable, so we feel safe. We try and feel safe by pretending or imagining that we know what things are because we've got a name for them, you know, they're gonna remain like, but things are permanently changing, yeah? So in a way, 
uh, meditation is very important for that, isn't it? You create a kind of consciousness that can remain in a kind of open but present state, which is a bit like the rose apple tree moment. Yeah, you, he's kind of present, but he's open. And it seems like that's what happened afterwards as well. After enlightenment, that continued. It's not like a Buddha doesn't, is, is illiterate all of a sudden and can't kind of name things. But the naming process is completely, it's like, it's just a name. It's not an actual thing in any real sense. It's a kind of movement of um, process. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so the, uh, those two veils, basically, they're, they're, they're covering something, aren't they? That's the whole point. They're kind of covering something uh, that's already there naturally, which I find very inspiring. There's a kind of, and you do get moments of that, don't you? You get little flashes sometimes when you're meditating, maybe you're on retreat. You get a moment where something is clear all of a sudden. There's just a clear luminosity to your consciousness. And you're like, why can't I just be like this all the time? Yeah? And so maybe the reason we can't be like this all the time is because we have these kind of coverings huh? that, we, that we have in front of us. And one way of saying it is you, Buddhism is a part of removing those coverings, yeah? You're removing those veils so that however you want to say it, the light can shine out or shine in. They're probably both the same thing in the end. Um, yeah, and it's a natural thing as well. I think that's the point. That's why their image, the memory is so important. It's not, it's not a kind of thing. It's not a shape you have to force yourself into. You don't have to become a, a Buddhist and they say, oh, because I'm a Buddhist now, da 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 and there's this shape to it. It's like it's an actual natural thing and Buddhism is a way of uncovering something that's already there, in, at least in potential, while well, it's there. And potentially um, one can live from that yeah? and, and live in that. Yeah, so it's a kind of image of natural unfolding. And um, in terms of natural images, I thought I'd just finish with a very well-known, uh, very well-known, um, how to say, uh, episode or chapter of the Buddha's life, which is um, after he was enlightened, yeah? Um, so there's this whole process has gone and it's Brahma, Sam Brahma Sahampati's request, yeah? And um, so, yeah, so the Buddha's enlightened, yeah? The, the Buddha is a Buddha now. There's kind of uh, all this stuff that I've been bumbling around with, fumbling around with, trying to kind of get across in some way. That's just a Buddha, that is a Buddha, it's a complete experience here, yeah? So subtle, so powerful, so unlikely, he said, and unusual, yeah? That he sits there and thinks to himself, is there any point trying to communicate this to anyone? Uh, probably not, yeah? No one's gonna get it, it's too, it's too subtle, yeah? We're too clunky and it's too subtle. And then um, this God, yeah? Uh, take that as you will, Brahma Sahampati turns up <laughs> and says to the Buddha uh, something along the lines of, no, um, you have to teach, yeah? There, there, are, there are beings in the world with little dust in their eyes, yeah? So it's a bit like this veil. Brahma Sahampati says to him, yeah, there's beings in the world that have little dust in their eyes and they will understand, yeah? They will understand if you, if you, if you communicate, yeah? Um, and in a way, that's the, 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 in a way, it's the arising of compassion in Buddhism, yeah? It's like this whole business of enlightenment, uh, wisdom, comes really at the same time as compassion, yeah? So this compassion is born out of a, the Buddha's sense um, that they're, well, from the Sahampati telling the Buddha uh, that there's beings with little dust in their eyes that will perish if you don't uh, help them, yeah? And then he has this uh, vision of us uh, as humanity, as this giant lake of lotuses, yeah? And some of the lotuses are kind of stuck in the mud under the water, some are near the surface, some are bursting through the surface, yeah? And that's how the Buddha sees us, essentially, yeah? As a kind of natural process of unfoldment, um, which I think is a profoundly positive view of us. Um, yeah. I'll leave it there. Thank you.